Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Camera Work Podcast number 37. And uh, I am John Ricard, and with me is... Hey, how you doing, guys? It's Ray Tamara. I know I've been um, uh, AWOL, but I'm back. So hopefully uh, we get some interesting topics and uh, feel free to email us, to contact us, to comment, and um, join the conversation. Right. You know, I always laugh when I go on an Instagram and then, you know, Instagram, it always goes like rate Instagram as if John Ricard rating Instagram is going to matter at all. It's so silly. But if you're listening to this podcast and on YouTube, I mean, on a good day, we get like 300 ish views on YouTube. If you make a comment on YouTube or tweet about us or something, we really notice it. I read every one of them. I respond to every one of them. So if you can, yeah, take a minute and make a comment or something because it gets noticed. It's not like rating something on. Or just pass it along to your photographer friends because um, this is definitely stuff that photographers talk about because I'm a photographer, John's a photographer, and you're a photographer or you have photo photographic interests. So just pass the conversation along, makes you think, and that's the, um, that's the bottom line is to make you think, to uh, stimulate your creativity so you can make better pictures. Right, and I think everybody's a photographer now anyway. But along that line, it's funny because uh, this is Christmas Eve today, 2015, and I'm reminded that last year, uh, right around this time, I decided to do a 365 project, and it didn't last that long, and I wanted to talk a few seconds about why. So a 365 project is where, like, you know, you carry a camera, and every day you take a photo, and you post it, and it sounds like a really good idea. You know, it's like I think we all have this vision of, like, wanting to be that guy that walks around with the camera, and everybody knows you, like, yeah, that's John. You know, he's always got his camera. And I said, you know, so I'm going to carry my Leica. That'll be the hook. It'll be like a Leica 365 project. And I really, really tried every day to carry the camera. But it, like, surprisingly became a burden very quickly to me. Like, how often do you carry um, a camera with you when you're just walking around not professionally shooting? Um, I mean, five days out of seven, I usually carry a camera. Um, the, the other thing is to not carry the Leica and just go with the iPhone. I know that you're limited, oh, but the, the um, but you can always do that. I don't know. I, I, there is definitely pressure to make pictures every day. And I, I talk to people all the time, especially with Instagram. And I shoot a lot of um, models and they're really, really nit picky about the pictures that they post on Instagram versus Facebook. They'll just let anything up there, but they really want to curate their Instagram images and make that have a theme. So one girl, she just all black and white. Other people, whatever your aesthetic is, you can definitely convey that visually through Instagram. And I think that's definitely something that people uh, factor into their Inst Instagram feeds. Right. But see, for me, when I tried the 365 project, the, the one of the first problems I had is just the idea of carrying something every day because mm -hmm. I don't like to carry stuff. And I know you seem to carry a lot more stuff than me. You seem to be fine with like a large backpack, especially like with camera gear when you're shooting. Whereas if I'm shooting, I need the camera bag empty and the camera bag stuffed under a table or hidden away. And I only have the two cameras on my body. But even if I'm just walking around, a lot of times I don't bring a book. I don't bring anything to carry. I like to just be free like that. And carrying the camera really became a burden. Just trying to, re and like if I bring my Leica, like I won't take it off my arm. I, I keep that strap on. If I go eat, I keep the strap on my arm or I loop it into my belt or something. And I don't know, I just found that over the course of every day, it really just became this burden that like there was this thing I was carrying and I couldn't just be free and, you know, if I'm going to like jujitsu or yoga or something, I have to like remember, like I have my camera. Let me not leave it when I leave this place. And I found that was one of the really the worst things about trying to do the 365 project was just the act of carrying the camera everywhere I go. I mean, but if you decided to do the project, then that's the that's the, the thing that you take on. It's like I want right. to work out. I want to work out and be fit, but I just don't want to work out. You don't so, do I, mean, I mean, that's right. the, it's like a the, diet. The, you don't want to do the work, yeah. you know. But then the so. second problem I ran into it was <laughs> I is is I found myself shooting things I didn't care about. And I think that's the one that bothered me the most was that sometimes I was taking a picture of something just because I have to take a picture today. So I'm walking around and I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking, and there's like a sign or there's some lights or it's raining and there's some water reflecting on the, wa and I don't care about the water and the sign, but I'm like, I've got to create a picture. So I'm taking this photo just for the 365 project. And I think that bothered me a lot 
with it, shooting things that I didn't care about, you know, and on the flip side, during the time I did it, which it lasted about, I don't know, maybe four months or so, or maybe about five, really, um, I did create some cool pictures, which is the good thing about it. I did end up taking more family pictures than I would have normally, and a few just random street shots that ended up being good, but it, it just bothered me to be shooting things that I didn't care about. And I wonder if anybody who's doing like a 365 project goes through that or like, do people care about like everything they shoot? Because I, I know I was just shooting stuff I didn't care about. I mean, when you say that, because I, 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 I'm not doing a 365 and I don't know what those limitations are. But I, I, when you say you don't care about what you shoot, then you narrow your focus. And then you're only focused on those shots and you make those shots happen instead of just being like, oh, I'll bump into a great shot or I'll bump into a great image. You're you're yeah. very focused on what you want to shoot and just taking it from yeah, there. Yeah, but it's so much work to get a picture every day. And the thing is, is that the, the 24 hours come so quick because if you think about it, you're sleeping half the day anyway. So you really only get this window, say for me, you wake up at six o'clock ish. I go to bed at midnight ish. It's not that much time, and it's like you nail a really good shot on Monday, and then by the time you wake up, it's like, oh, my God, I got to get another picture. And then, like, if you're doing something, you know, you're shooting, or what, just whatever you're doing, before you know it, it's like 7 p.m., and you're like, oh, my God, like, I got to get this picture done before I go to bed. And um, I just found it to be such a burden that um, I'm impressed with anyone who can manage to do it, like, for a full year. I'm impressed because... It was way more difficult than I thought it would be. And when I dropped it, I was relieved. And um, what I tried to do recently was a 100-day project. I, I said, I'm going to do a 100-day instead of 365. It'd be 100 days. That way I can see daylight. I can see the end of it. Like I could be halfway through and go on only 40 more days. So I, I hashtagged it on Instagram, 100 days of Leica. I was going to do 100 days every day. And I started doing it. And then my M240 finally went out of rangefinder calibration after a year and a half, so I sent that into Leica, and then the M they already had for a sensor problem, sensor corrosion, so I didn't have a camera, so I stopped the 365. I stopped the 100-day 365 project as well, so I think that's the end of that for me, at least. I mean, we, you, uh, there's always limitations, but instead of doing, like, if you're, if you're pressed to do uh, a picture a day, then do a picture a week. And it's 52, 52 yeah, pictures in the year or, yeah. or just like something yeah. you can't you can't go from zero to 100 immediately. Yeah. You can just build yourself up yeah, and I get mean, those muscles like, yeah. you know, the progression. Yeah. One a week. Maybe I could manage. And you know, reminded 52. me the other thing that is frustrating about it is some days I would shoot some amazing thing. But because it was a client job, I could not post it that day. So then I felt like I still had to go shoot something else. Even though I did this great shoot, but I can't post it for whatever reason. It's a client job. So I'm not going to be able to post it for a few months. So I'm like, oh, my God. It was such a mess. But um, I was posting it on a site called Storehouse, which is a really nice platform that I would mm -hmm. urge people to look into. It's a place where you can create something that looks like a blog. It's like Instagram, mm -hmm. but it's designed more to merge pictures and video. And you can write some good text to go with it. It's completely mm -hmm. free. It's called Storehouse. And I think my, you could find me there, I guess, under John Ricard Storehouse, or if not, um, I think I called it cameraworknyc.com, mm -hmm. and I think you go there and you find it. Mm -hmm. And I'm proud of some of the work, but man, that's a lot of work. But I was mm -hmm. thinking of it because the new year is like five days away, and you know, you're tempted to start it again, and I'm like, nah, I don't think I'm going to do it. You know what's <laughs> funny is that, like, I've known you for years, and, uh, and when we talk, and, and you can hear it on the, on the podcast, and then sometimes, like, with John, he'll... <laughs> He'll find something that bothers him, and he'll complain ad nauseum, complain, complain, complain. Whereas me, I'll find something that's a problem, and I'll figure out a solution and move no. forward. No. Whereas like John that's will no be fun. complaining, <laughs> like well, I'm still like GIF. You talk to John about GIF, which is a program, an editing program. But complain, 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 right. it's a program, complain. Right. Just to be clear, that's a program that like if you if you work with Getty Images, they give you this program that you use to upload your images to Getty. It's the only way you can upload to Getty. And I can't stand the program. I literally stopped working with the, the company Film Magic because I didn't want to have to deal with using that program. And in hindsight, it turned out to be a huge financial mistake because I chose to stay with Retina. Retina went under, then Retina deleted all my images. It was a huge financial mistake. But like you said, you kind of work your way through it and figure out how to work GIFT. 
and I'll just sit and complain and go like, I just hate this program. So, and, so yeah, but, like even our, on this conversation, <laughs> John's complaining about 365 days and I'm going, right. well, go to 52 days that we go to a right. iPhone and then he'll just still, come, well, 365, then I go to 100. It, it's right. just like the, the, <laughs> the whole thing. process. Right. But I think those for me sometimes though, I, I do become kind of all or nothing. I become kind of obsessed and like anything, usually your strength is your weakness, I find. Whatever is your strength is also your weakness. So that serves me well a lot. And then other times it actually does hurt me. I agree with you. And my wife will say the same thing. And this podcast is a really good example. Like, we don't do the podcast all the time. And most of the podcasts I listen to, uh, D. Snyder, Joe Roke, and uh, Talking Dead podcast, uh, Eddie Trunk, a couple of them I listen to. And they all do them more regularly. And for me, it's really two reasons why we don't do it more regularly. One, if I don't have any topics, I don't want to do it and then just kind of fake it or be too repetitive. So I really wait until I have a few topics to talk about. And there's really three today I wanted to talk about. And that's why we're doing it. And then the second thing is, is that it's hard to match the schedules, whether it's you or someone else. Because sometimes I, I was actually, we were trying to get, I was trying to get this female photographer named, that sounds bad, female photographer. I was trying to get this photographer named Kawana Curry on because I had a conversation with her at Unique Photo recently and I wanted to kind of recreate that on the podcast and I've tried to get her here like four or five times and the schedules don't match so I can't do it and your schedule is super hard to match. Friday is the day you and I tend to not work but that's the day you do your personal work and I don't want to mess that up with this so it ends up making me not do the podcast and then my wife will say well, why don't you do the podcast alone sometimes? That way you can get it done at least. And whenever you're free for half an hour, hour, you can knock it out. And I'm like, I don't want to do it alone. No, I don't like that vision. The vision is it's a conversation, even though I'm doing 90% of the talking. And she will go just kind of like you're saying, like instead of sort of solving the problem, you're yeah. like complaining yeah. about the problem and finding this wall and going like, well, we can't do the podcast because I can't get the guest yeah. when or you need to just, because she said, well, if you do some alone, doesn't mean you can't do the next one with Ray or with or another fi or person. Or figure so. out, like, how to you know. do do it by phone. Because that's what a lot of oh, people... Oh, I hate... I don't like that, yeah, though. Our audio see, quality is better than the ones with the phone. Yeah, okay? but there's all <laughs> these podcasts that I listen to, and they're, like, they're calling it in all the time. Yeah, and, and, and you, if you're, yeah. if you're not contemplating it as a as a workaround, then you're you're trapped. Right. And you should just come, come complain, complain, and then people are going to stop... Stop listening to you well, complain. Well, stop listening. And I got another thing to talk about, which hopefully is not a complaint, but, but this is sort of like, and I, I call it an epiphany, but it's a really minor one, but it's going to take me a second to kind of get through this. But it's regarding like the mirrorless revolution in photography. And it's right. funny because you and I hung out a lot at the Javits Photo Plus Expo. We were together quite a bit there. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's there, but there's just a lot of stuff. And like lately, and I know you mentioned it, you, just, you don't need a lot of stuff. That's just, I think that all this new product uh, plays on the insecurities of photographers. Like I need this, this, and this to make my pictures great. And right. I mean, I've fallen into that trap where I'm buying a whole lot of j not junk, but just expensive <laughs> well, stuff it, that it I never use. <laughs> so <laughs> at the end of the day, you just have to shoot regardless of what you have. Right. And then you're going to get better. Your eye gets better. Your um, instincts get better. And then right. you can um, augment that with your new skill set with your new vision then you can right. argument that with new gear but it's not critical so right and this is what i'm usually saying is exactly what you're saying yeah. and it's funny because if you look if you go back and listen to episode 36 i talk about sony and leica with a guy named steven gomez and i say exactly what you're saying and i say and i've always said to people one of the things i like best about using my leica which is a very stripped down camera compared to most other cameras is it reminds me that the only thing that matters is what's in front of your camera like right. what are you shooting or who are you shooting right nothing else really matters about all these settings and metering modes uh -huh. and whatever fine and that's always been my my perspective and i right. still believe that even though i'm going to say something slightly different today but like when we were at javits it was just funny because it's like everywhere you went there was a guy on a podium talking about how much they hate mirrors and i'm like do these guys go home and go to their bathroom and just smash all the mirrors in the house like joan crawford or something because it's just like we're mirrorless we're mirrorless and they're all so proud of themselves and they're so happy and i'm taking the attitude of like hey 
what's in front of your camera is the only thing that really matters. Who cares if it's mirrorless or not? And all these little features you're talking about with the Sony A7 series cameras, whatever. And again, I say it all the time. I use this Leica a lot. And one of the places I shoot, for example, is where I train jujitsu. I shoot a lot of pictures there. And it's difficult to shoot some type of activity like people doing jujitsu with a manual focus camera. Right. So I miss a lot of shots when I'm shooting there. And worse than that is the Leica buffer is very small, meaning I can only get about seven pictures and I can't take another photo. I've got to wait for it to write the file, then it'll take like one and then one. I can't shoot as much as I'd like to. Causes me to miss a lot of shots. But for me, that almost becomes like a badge of honor because I enjoy using the camera so much. I do love that camera that I'm okay with working around the difficulty of focusing people moving or working with this buffer. Somehow I look at it when I get a good shot that I really earned it. And I'm more proud of that than if I just grabbed my Nikon and blasted it through 11 frames a second and nailed the shot. And people say to me, oh man, you know, your stuff at the Academy is so good. And I'm thinking to myself like, yeah, you know, it'd be even better if I just picked up my Nikon. You have no idea the limitation I'm working with and I'm still producing good images. But somehow in my mind, this all makes sense. And I don't expect it to make sense to other people, but it just makes sense to me. I like the tool, I like using the tool, and I think it's always cool in photography to act like you don't care about your gear. It's always like, the only thing that matters is the, the thing. I don't care what I shoot with. But I think it is okay to be in love with the tool, like a painter is in love with the process of painting. He doesn't just want the final result. He loves the process of painting. He should love his brushes and the smell of the paint and the canvas and the feel of the brush on the paint. He should love it all, just like I love my camera. But here's a little minor epiphany I had. So I was at Unique Photo. I was given, a, they did this like Unique uh, Expo. They did their version of like Photo Plus in Jersey. A really nice thing. They have a lot of speakers. It's dirt cheap. It's like $10 a presentation. And I presented two different days. And I always like to watch the other presentations when I'm there you know, to see how other people are presenting. I learn a lot about how I should present when I watch other people do it. And they, as, as I'm getting ready to leave, it's like eight, eight o'clock Saturday night, I see a whole crowd coming into the room to watch one of the presentations. I'm like, who is this? They said, it's Chris Burkhardt. I'm like, well, who is that? I never heard of the guy. He's a landscape guy. And I'm like, well, there's something I don't care about because I don't take one picture a year that doesn't have a person in it. I'm a people photographer. I just don't care about things. So. I heard them say that this was the most people they ever had for, unique, for a unique photo presentation. They had Joe McNally that same weekend, and this guy drew more people in it. I said, well, hell, I got to go watch this guy and see who is this guy, what is he about, whatever. So I start learning about him as I'm sitting there. The guy next to me is a big fan of Chris Burkhardt. Oh, we start talking. Turns out the guy has 1.3 million Instagram followers. Like, can you imagine that? Like, my followers, which is under 3,000, is like a statistical aberration in, you know, in like his, it goes 1.3 million. You wouldn't even have the 3,000, my number in there. But in any event, one of the things he mentions, he's a Sony shooter, uses a Sony A7 cameras. And one of the cameras he mentioned he uses is this Sony A6000, which if you do watch this on YouTube, because we are on iTunes and YouTube, I'm holding it up now if you want to see what it looks like. It looks like mm -hmm. a point and shoot camera, but it has a chip like a Nikon, like D7000, like a Nikon DX. And he was talking about how he uses the D6000, like this camera lets him do um, 11 frames a second, right? Well, it's not set to that now, but you could do 11 frames a second with this camera. And it's got a really good chip, 24 megapixels, great autofocus. And it's like he's using this camera as part of his real work. So the guy's traveling all over the world, like these amazing spots in Iceland. But sometimes what he's doing is just whipping out the equivalent of a point and shoot. And just going like 11 frames a second and nailing the image. He's not thinking of the process of shooting at all. And I think his focus is on the sharing of the image, that 1.3 million people who are looking at it. And it just kind of made me think for a second. I said, you know, maybe I can drop a little bit of the love of the process of shooting and change a little bit of that over to the sharing of the image and try to take some joy from that part of it rather than the actual shooting, taking more pride, more enjoyment from the result rather than the process. Like this little light bulb went off in my head. I said, you know, I'm gonna buy one of these cameras. The thing is, I paid $450 to get this, the camera and the lens, which is like a 24 to 70 millimeter lens on this thing. 
So it's like I'm going to start shooting at the academy with this, which I already did. And it's like in 10 minutes, I can get more good pictures with this than like a week of shooting with the Leica because you just walk up and go 11 frames a second and it's done. It's focusing for you. You can go whatever angle you want. You don't have to look through the viewfinder. You can look at the little screen on the back. It's so easy to shoot that, again, for me, it's almost not as much fun shooting with it, but I can create more good images with it. So the shift for me is, well, maybe I can try to get more enjoyment from creating a higher number of good photographs or the fact that more people are happy because of the work you've created. So for me, that's a pretty big shift. I call it like an epiphany, but it's a kind of like a, a minor one. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know. Like, you you always get on this stuff about, I want the best camera. I'm proud to do this. I'm proud to do it. I want the D4S 7000, just like a sex or so M7, yeah. like all this stuff. And I'm like, oh, okay. Um, that before, it used to always be about, is the gear going to make me money? And right. um, if it doesn't, then it does it. I don't, I don't really consider it. And lately, um, my whole, everything has changed. My money, the, the money is stopping, so I have to refigure it out. And right. I, I, I don't know. I don't know what that, <laughs> that is. I, I just think it's interesting, I though, that, that I, again, I just think it's d interesting that there are guys who, I, I don't know, I just think, again, that the point for me is just that, that putting the focus really 100% over to the end result and not the process. Very different for me because the process has always been a huge part of it. But I'm trying to shift it a little bit. So like I said, I did buy this camera, 450 bucks. Look at this. Here, you can listen to the shutter on this thing. Well, I got yeah. it off, but listen to this. At the, yeah, I mean. How crazy is it? Like yeah, it's still going. Look at this. Yeah, you, you could, uh, that would take six months to do that with my Leica. <laughs> I mean, to do that many just, pictures, it takes six Just months. at the end of the day, you just got to be, you got to be proud of the work. And you've got to do, you've got to well, take the pictures, that's even though it's like, doing. That's what Chris Burkhardt's yeah, yeah, doing. Yeah. He's spending like a, a two days to get to the location. You know, he's like yeah. hiking for 10 hours to get yeah. to the top of this mountain that and no one else is going to get to. But then when he gets there, he might at some times just whip out this A6000 and go click, click, click. But boom. see, Very like if, if you're going to hike that stuff, like... Uh, I could see using that camera because it's small and it fits with his work workflow. Like I would even consider using that for my j job stuff simply because now, you know, I, I've done videos of the stuff that I used to carry and it was like 40 pounds on my back, like right. lenses and lenses. You, you saw the 300 to eight and I would carry that. And now I don't because I just can't do it anymore. Right. I can't, my body well, he talks has about that a lot. Right. Because see, he's so, doing, he's doing a lot of, all landscape so he, yeah. he talks about that i've looked at some of his videos now and yeah he talks about that a lot you have to Whereas, strip down the gear and make right. it light but make sure that the um the the cameras can perform right. to get you the stuff and it doesn't i mean I, regardless if he's taking good pictures and he's oh. using the camera that works for him then that's absolutely that's fine right. and, that, and that's i think you have to figure out what your workflow is what gear you need to make those pictures and not really focus on what other people or if anything just uh, what i do is always look at other people to see if their workflow right. um it, it resonates with me and how i can apply that to what i'm you know, I've doing i've always done that because i talked um i even even on number 36 i talk a lot about that how in a way you should live in a cave to some degree you should do what works for you and ignore like you said because you go to photo plus expo they're all screaming about this and that and you need this and you need that and you really just need the right thing in front of your camera so i've always been very good at tuning out a lot of that hype which is why i dismissed the sony's and the mirrorless for so long but it was really just listening to this person speak to listen to chris burkhardt speak and just kind of making the shift and said maybe i can try to fall in love with the sharing a little more than the process of shooting kind of made me do a shift but i've yeah. been very good at again i'm the only person i know who runs around trying to shoot with this like i have no one else bothers with this except for me so i'm very good at tuning out the noise and doing what works for me but right. this did give me a little bit of a shift into the way other people look at it. it I don't right. know. Again, I'm not sure if I'm explaining it in words that are yeah. clear enough, but it um, yeah. it was definitely like an epiphany for me. So I did run out and buy one of these. I sold my Fuji X-E1 and I sold my Panasonic LX7 just because I'm trying to declutter my life. So if I bought a new camera, I want to get rid of some. I don't want to have like all these different systems. I'm trying to keep it as stripped down as I can. But I'm gonna you know, let you guys know how it goes with this little camera for certain shoots and um, right. we'll see how that, uh, 
how that goes. All right. right. But um, in other uh, news, whatever, another topic that I, I thought was interesting was um, this Peter Hurley book. I'm holding it up if you're uh, on a YouTube page. It's called the, oh, I guess it's just called The Headshot. All right. Mm -hmm. Peter Hurley, The Headshot, which I read and um, I thought was pretty interesting. Did you read the book or how much of it did you read? I've been reading portions of it and it certainly makes sense. Uh, I, I've also watched the videos and that's uh, that's just I mean, that's also educational. That's also insightful. Uh, this guy is making a lot of money. This guy is making like, you know, uh, uh, he's just succeeding at this. And there's other people who are emulating him and they're succeeding as well. Just like everyone at the end of the day everyone wants great pictures and as a photographer yeah. as a, as a person that's providing a service cuz i think that for my for my stuff that i you know it's i have a creative um, investment but if i'm photographing other people i have a responsibility responsibility to make sure that the photos are great or that right. are uh, applicable to what they need it for. That's that. That's been. Um, that's why they right. hire me, and it's important to develop myself professionally, develop myself, and um, make sure that my pictures are on par. So I right. definitely think this is valuable because yeah. a lot of the people that I work with, they need great headshots, and even I'm incorporating some of the things that I've learned in this book and in um, videos from Creative Live, Sue Bright stuff, to really get um, great headshots, and people are like, Ray, I love this stuff. I That's absolutely cool. love this stuff. Cool. This works for me. And I'm mm -hmm. like, good, because that makes me more valuable and that I'm also providing the service that they need and um, that right. they need. Right, but I thought it was interesting because you mentioned the video, and I think that um, the video is cool. I think the video is called The Art of the Headshot. Right. I think the video is good because you're watching the process of how he works, and he does take fantastic headshots. You know, he seems he like focuses on on one specific kind of narrow type of shooting, white background, headshots, like shoulders up. And he focuses on that and he just mastered it beautifully. But I found on the video, I think his personality might get in the way of the video a little bit in a sense that you could watch the video and think, like, I can't be him because he has a particular style. Like there was one point on the video where he um, he's where he has this way he works with the people and he says to the, the, the girl that he's worked that he's shooting he says hey you know i'm going to direct a movie soon and i want you to be in it like who would you want your co-star to be or something he's kind of creating this fantasy which is eliciting certain expressions from her which is what he's trying to photograph and then after a minute or two he says to her like well i'm not really directing a movie i'm just i just said that to get the expression out of you or i'm just teasing you or whatever whereas say that dynamic for me wouldn't work i don't right. want to trick the person you know, that would wreck the rest of the shoot for me. I violated the trust there for him that works. So when you watch the video, to me, the personality is a little, you know, it can kind of get in the way of what he's saying for me, at least in terms of how he relates to people. But when you read the book, it's like he comes across as almost like this uh, people psychologist and like master of how things look and angles and how to position people. And it's super detailed. Like it'd be like, 10, 15 pages on like how to get the jaw right or how to get the eyes right or how to get the forehead right. And a lot of things you might not have even thought about. And um, I think they're both valuable, the book and the video. But I think at $44, which, you know, you go to buy the book for $44, you're like, damn, is it like really $44, $44.99? But there's yeah, but a you bought lot the book, of information. Yeah, you bought the book for yeah. $44. You can, yes. I can buy the book for $20. <laughs> yeah, and Ray's like, you can get it on Kindle or whatever. Yeah, like, I, don't, like, yeah. I, I wanted the book. I just bought the yeah. fucking book. And but, um, but the book is valuable. It's worth $44. <laughs> it's worth $20. Whatever you, uh, whatever you pay for it, you'll, there's right. a lot of value in the book because right. this guy right. is doing it. He's making a living right. at this. He's, uh, he's um, segued into uh, regular portraiture celebrity portraiture because of right. this and um mm -hmm. there's people that are copying them so if right. this is something in your wheelhouse and you mm -hmm. want to take great headshots or you want to start that definitely get the book to right. um learn what like this this is like the the industry standard so I, I agree and i think it's a modern industry standard because i right. think industry standards in photography need to be updated at least every five years this is to me good for 2015 and that's that's huge you don't right. want to go back to the 80s and find a video on headshots things may not really be the same but um one of the things i like that he mentioned in the book was this idea that 
if you keep the people talking and you get them talking about other stuff, let's say you've got the, the, the person there and she wants to be an actress and then you're talking to her about, well, what kind of movie would you want to be in and uh, who would you want your co-star to be or whatever. Now she can't really think about the photo shoot because you can't do two things at the same time, two cognitive processes at the same time. So if she's thinking, trying to answer this question, like who would you want to direct your uh, first movie? As she's trying to run through directors in her head and who she'd want to work with, she really can't sit and think to herself, oh my God, I'm nervous. Am I smiling right? Are the pictures good? And I thought that was a really interesting thing. I never thought of it that way before. Clearly, I talk to people when I photograph them, but I never thought of it as consciously as like, hey, if I could just get you talking about anything other than this photo shoot, you will not be thinking about the photo shoot and we can get a better image because your mind will be someplace else other than how am I doing picture-wise. I thought that was interesting. And another part that I liked was this idea of um, saying to people, again, this is what I got from the book. I'm not saying this is even in the book, but the idea of like trying to say to someone like, we need you mentally to be thinking of yourself as whatever it is we're shooting you as, an actress or whatever, but we don't need you thinking of like, oh my God, I hate taking pictures and I hope these come out good. Just that mentally you have to be putting across this vision that you are a superstar. And you were with me. I did some executive portraits not that long ago, and I was like saying to the, the executive we were shooting, like, there's got to be friends of yours who would kill to have your job working for like Sony Records. And that's what you have to project, that like you've got this cool job and you were just with One Direction, you know, last weekend. So, you know, just trying to communicate that idea, putting that, putting that into get, getting people's headspace to be thinking of things like that, the positive about their life rather than, thinking about like, oh my God, I hope these pictures come out good. So you don't want them thinking about the photo shoot at all. You're thinking about that, but they are in another zone. Right. So I thought that was a really interesting thing that, again, I've, I've done it, but I never really thought of it consciously until I read the book. So, yeah, what, so it, what, he talks about, um, what he talks about in the book, and I haven't gotten to it yet, is the psychology behind, the, uh, behind photography. How you can um, get inside a person's head and change their whole outlook in life. It's just like visiting a, a therapist and talking about yeah, things. That's I mean, interesting because I, I'm always saying that I, I don't shoot anything important. I've, I've said this for years. Like everything I shoot, it's like, you know, like pretty girls and music people. Okay, great. Nice contribution to society. Like, so what? Because I look at all these guys and they're in Africa and they're in another country and they're shooting all these like interesting, cool, important things. But he did kind of put across this idea that, well, maybe you can change someone's self-image by giving them the right photograph, that they're not going to hate being photographed or hate the way they look after you photograph them. So maybe what I do and what you do as people who aren't doing this like humanitarian type documentary photography, maybe what we're doing is important because we're changing people's opinions like of themselves you know, daily. So um, one thing, though, I thought that was not good in the book or was weak in the book was I felt like photo-wise, I kind of wish he had shot more photographs specifically for the book. I felt like we were looking at a lot of headshots and there were times where he would describe like how not to do the jaw and how to do the jaw or how not to do the eyes and to do the eyes. And there might be a sample of that and there might not, but there weren't enough samples of that. It wasn't like he really went out and said like, I'm going to photograph the wrong jaw and the right jaw. And at one point he mentioned something he called triangle lighting that he uses. I do this triangle lighting and he describes it. And there's like one photo that kind of shows it, but it wasn't a clear photograph saying this is the triangle lighting. So I think it would have been cool if he'd actually photographed specifically for the book. And I felt where so much effort went into the writing of the book to do an entire chapter on just like the nose or the eyes or whatever was amazing. But I think a little more into the actual pictures of the book would have been cool as well. But overall, man, um, well worth uh, 45 bucks. And uh, I definitely got something from it. And I've been shooting even just here 10 years and I got something from what he was um, saying in the book. Yeah, I mean, at the end, of, at the end of the day, you you're you are obligated or you're required to always personally um, to up your game. If you're at this, um, if you're at a, the same level, then you it's not working. So right. I know that it's important that I, I'm doing that and you should be doing that too. And right. hopefully your photography gets better because 
you're providing a service here and um, your service has to be great. Right. And yeah, I think you do have to stay current. And it was funny to me because I'm, I photographed a 14 year old girl the other day. She was here with her mom and they came to get like this model pictures or whatever you want to call it. And about halfway through the shoot, it was going good. I was really relaxed. I knew we were nailing it. So I said, I'm going to put us on Periscope in a while. Is that okay? And then they both went like, what's Periscope? And it was funny to me because the girl was 14 and she didn't know what Periscope is, which is a live streaming app for your phone where you can broadcast whatever you want live across the internet and people can watch it live. And I just thought it was funny because you would think like at her age, she's going to know the hot new app and I'm going to be the older photographer who doesn't understand the new technology. But I was like ahead of her on that curve and I was proud of myself because I tried to stay current and try to keep myself educated because I think those things are important to your business to not, you know, ignore whatever is going on. So I thought that was funny. And I think she's on Periscope now because she was having a ball with it, you know? Okay. So um, unless there's some uh, burning issue you wanted to touch upon. No, no. Just um, just do work. Mm -hmm. Make make pictures, um, photograph a lot, read, uh, what is it, the art of, you know, the, the, the war of art. The if war of art. Fantastic that's, that's, book. That, that's definitely something at the end of the year to re, um, restock and uh, to find out what you're passionate about and um, continue to press forward into 2016. Right. right. And uh, really briefly, just to be clear, there's a very famous book called The Art of War. I think it's by Sun Tzu. Is that right? Yeah. Right. That's a famous book. A lot of people know. I think it's even public domain, meaning it's pretty cheap to get that book online. Yeah. But this was a book called The Art of no the, no, the war <laughs> of art the war of art he yeah. kind of flipped the title yeah. and he just talks about the something called resistance we've talked about it in a podcast I won't get into it today but he just talks about the struggles you go through as a creative and he actually provides um, a solution for getting through that and I think when you look at people who are good at this like a Chris Burkhart with 1.3 million followers if you look at his Instagram you instantly understand why he is that successful because he's doing the work he's going to these different places and he's taking great photographs there so and that is why we call it the podcast camera work because you need a camera and then you have to do the work and um, I think that's the hardest part for me sometimes is doing the work I think uh, I got a lot of cameras but uh, sometimes I got to really get out there and do a little more work so hopefully 2016 will bring even more work okay um you can find me on instagram it's at john ricard j-o-h-n-r-i-c-a-r-d i hope you uh comment on some pictures or something there and you know i always write back when people comment on me and you can find ray there as well yep you can find me at um on instagram at r tamara r t a m a r r a um i'm on facebook um ray tamara uh, www.raytamara.com. Um, if you want, you can like, or you don't, you don't have to like, I don't really care. <laughs> All you gotta do is just look at the pictures and if it moves you good, if it doesn't, then I'm um, complaining. That's, that's fine <laughs> right. too. All okay? right. Thanks guys. We will see you. Uh, I won't say soon, but the next time we see you like today, we will have something to talk about. And I think that's all that matters. All right. Thanks okay, guys. Bye-bye.